Hello, everyone. How's it going? And I am MLS Weech, and welcome to the book cover reveal special for my upcoming book, Betrayed. I'm super excited, and I genuinely hope you guys enjoy this, and I really hope you like the cover. Uh, I wasn't able to have the guests that uh, I was hoping to have. It's not completely unexpected. It just takes a little time to get things up and running, and it takes a lot for people to coordinate their time and their schedules. And I'll just have to improve on that and work to get better. But I still have uh, a lot of things that I'd like to talk to you about, uh, uh, to share a little bit about me. And uh, I have a great book cover that I wanna show off. So uh, let's get right down to it. Uh, the first thing I wanna do is just kind of answer some general questions that uh, I hear a lot. Uh, if this is your first time watching, do me a favor, click on the like and subscribe button and the bell notification. That way you'll know when I get new content. The most regular content I provide is every week. I look at seven book covers and then I let you guys all vote on which is your favorite. That's not what we're doing here. Uh, this is just an opportunity to talk more about me, myself as an author and what I'm doing and what I'm working on. So uh, I am a paranormal science fiction fantasy author. Most of my stories come in that realm. And uh, I have been at this actually since 2015 is when my first book came out. Uh, so I wanna talk about some of the questions that I see a lot and just some general questions that people ask me and uh, just, help you all get to know me a little better. So uh, first question, if you could travel to any fictional book world, where would you go and what would you do there? That's very easy for me. I would go to Pern. Anne McCaffrey's Dragon Riders of Pern is my favorite book series ever. I read it quite frequently. Um, it's one of only three or four series that I reread. Uh, even though that series as I kind of view it is complete. My favorite arc is what I call that main arc. Uh, and I would absolutely go to Pern. I would, I would bond a dragon and I would fly around and fight the thread and do whatever else is happening. Uh, so that's, that's, that's too easy for me to do. And then it goes, uh, what books are on your summer reading list this year? So for me personally, you can follow me on Goodreads. I am on that platform. Uh, I am pretty loyal to my TBR list. Uh, there are a few authors who, if they come out with a new book, I will finish what I'm reading and then jump straight to that book. Uh, Brandon Sanderson is usually on that list. Um, I like the Dresden Files, so I'm going to go over to that series uh, when I get a chance. Um, so those are some people who are exceptions. Uh, but uh, if you follow my Goodreads page, you can look down uh, uh, what's going on. And I am, I'm probably reading in that order manga, like every now and again, I'll pick up a, a handful of manga and I'll read those. And those are just quicker. So, uh, it, it, it doesn't take as much time. Uh, so the other thing with my book covers, uh, when a book cover wins the book cover of the month, I go ahead and I buy that book and I give it a shot because it gives authors, uh, a shout out. It gives designers a shout out. Uh, you know, sometimes a, a New York Times bestseller wins and, and my lowly little one sale doesn't help them too much. But uh, uh, even if I were like a best selling, super famous author, I would absolutely appreciate uh, 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 the chance to be a part of something like this. So um, how do you deal with writer's block? That's the next question I see here in this list I got. Um, I think this might be a little controversial. I, I, I don't necessarily understand writer's block. I understand a writer having a deadline on a specific project and getting stuck. And if that's how one defines writer's block, then, then that makes sense. Uh, and what I do if I'm stuck on a particular project I'm working on is I just jump to another project. Uh, I don't get stuck for very long periods of time. Um, and uh, honestly, uh, um, I've always found that if you get stuck, it becomes like a big deal if you're struggling and you're just forcing yourself to write something that isn't really there right now. 
Uh, so the easiest thing for me to do is jump to one of my other projects. Uh, and I usually have about three that are in some form of development with me. So it's never, it's never very difficult for me to jump on another project. I can respect though authors working on something that is coming out or being stuck on something that's coming out. Um, and I have a luxury being a self-published author because I, I don't have editors and, and book promoters and people breathing down my neck. So I can't imagine what that would do to my stress levels. Uh, but that's kind of how I get around it. Sometimes stepping away from one thing you're working on can really help you, uh, can really help you out. Uh, next question I see is what is the best thing about being a writer? Uh, for me, I like it when uh, I'm at a convention or I'm at a show and I, and I sell some of my book. Let's say I do it on Friday. And a lot of the people in my neck of the woods, when they go to conventions, they go to all three days. So I'll hand them the book on Friday and they'll come see me on Saturday and be like, oh, I'm halfway through your book. And then they'll come to me on Sunday and be like, I finished your book. I really loved it. And it's even more awesome when they're like, oh, let me buy another one or something like that. Um, but seeing someone read my book and enjoy it is easily why uh, uh, what I love most about it. And it's probably what keeps me going uh, uh, because when you're an author, a common misconception, I think a lot of people are like, oh, I want to be a famous author. Uh, and sometimes people think it's, it's it, it, being a successful, a financially successful author is about so much more than talent. Uh, Brandon Sanderson did a blog about this or, or a video about this. Uh, and if you can search that, he'll talk about it. And uh, he's, he's definitely a more reliable source of information uh, in that regard than I am. But I take a lot of comfort in knowing that finding that financial success has a lot to do with stars aligning and other things happening. Um, so if you're an aspiring author, you have to love it enough that just writing the books, not even publishing them, not even being read, in order to be an author and really endure the trials of being an author, and in fact, to gain that financial success too, uh, you have to be willing to be rejected a lot. You have to be willing to not be successful for long periods of time and just keep at it and keep working and keep moving. And for me, the best part about being an author is, is having someone read it and enjoy it. And that's always got me motivated to write the next book and write the next book and write the next book. Uh, so I guess that covers any advice I might have for, for aspiring writers. I do plan on this channel to eventually start doing a series. I want to develop a series of YouTube videos where I start from idea to published because that's something I understand very well. And I want people to be able to watch these videos and follow along with them and do them in order and come up and, and have a completed novel to show for it. That's kind of one of the things I want to contribute to the community. Uh, and so that leads me to the last question in this question and answer portion of this video. Uh, where did I get the idea for this book? Uh, so the weird thing with this, with this particular series is I am typically very flighty with uh, where I go. I'll write one book and then I'll get super motivated to write something. And it's usually pretty different in some way, shape or form. And uh, so I talked with a bunch of people I work with, uh, uh, a bunch of other authors, uh, shout out to the slush brain. Uh, I talked to uh, people I really respect. And the trouble with becoming financially viable, becoming financially successful as an author is you have to build a following. And there are some people who are truly transcendent. I think, uh, you know, there are some authors out there who can scribble on a napkin and it will be a bestseller. Uh, but they have that following already. Uh, for someone like me who wants to write straight paranormal one, one time and then horror the next, it, it makes it a little hard to build that following and to get people to just enjoy your writing because they enjoy your particular style of writing. So I was looking at all the stuff I have and I currently have 11 titles available. That's not necessarily the same number as books, uh, but there, there's a lot out there. The, the, the issue that I, I feel I, I started for myself was there's not like a place they can start. There's not like a home section of books 
uh, you know, that you can come to. And it's great. I think that I have a very, very small, but very, very loyal fan base, people who just enjoy my writing because it's me. And that's awesome. But if you're going to build a platform and you're going to build a a business out of this, you got to start somewhere. So I wrote Caught. And what happened is my first book, The Journals of Bob Drifter, was huge. It was 120,000 words, uh, very deep, very character driven. And it's draining to write something that big. And so I just wanted something light. I wanted something that was fun, fast paced. And uh, I, I wrote Caught. And I wrote it. And in my head, I realized that there were some other ideas that could come from down there. But I didn't want to I didn't want to go down that avenue because I'm a dog chasing his tail. I'm sitting here thinking like, no, I want to write this next. And then I want to write this next. And I did. And what ended up happening is I have a lot of books out. And then some people saw Cot and they wanted to know what happens next. Now, that's not because Cot ends on this big cliffhanger or anything. I, I didn't even really imagine writing the other parts of this, this trilogy until very far down the line. Um, but when I had people ask about like, so what happens after this? Do they do this? Do they do that? Um, I, I noted that it was something that people were interested in hearing. And then my brother-in-law, who's also my best friend, who's also my confidant, um, he, he was reading Cot, and he came across one line and he asked a question. He's like, why, why is this true? Why is this in this book? And I was just talking about my books and I offhandedly mentioned like, well, no, this is true because of this. And Ben was like, what? And I go, yeah, no, this is what happened. And he's like, are you serious? And you're not going to write that book? And I'm like, well, I wasn't planning on it. So like, like a good loving brother does, he, he grumbled at me for a minute. And then I immediately started to work on uh, Betrayed. Betrayed actually takes place six years after Caught. And for people who really want to know kind of what happened in the midterm, uh, you can actually read Repressed, which features Caitlin, one of the main characters for the whole series. And if I'm being honest, she's probably the main character for the whole arc. Uh, some people can argue Sal, and Sal is indeed the primary. He's the leader of the team. He's like the hero of the group. Uh, but we're watching Caitlin grow. And because the Oneros log was always designed to be my origin story for a superhero universe, it's it's watching this grow and seeing Caitlin come into her own. Um, And so that's how Betrayed started becoming kind of a priority for me. And Betrayed is a continuation of that saga. In Cot, these individuals are trapped in perpetual series of night terrors. They're, They're constantly being haunted. They're constantly being attacked. And the plot of Cot is seeing how these characters uh, manage to escape these nightmares and why, they're, why are they trapped? What's happening? Who's doing this to them? And what's the overall end game? Cot wraps up all those questions. And then the idea is now these people have found this power as a result of these night terrors. And what do they do with it? Betrayed ties back to the government portion of this saga. In Cot, there's a general named Pedersen, and he was originally given permission to pursue a special operations force. He went about it in ways that were horrible and evil, and the government quickly shut him down. But now the government is seeing the members of Neros doing all these um, a team with superpowers kind of stuff. Uh, they're doing these vigilante operations and the government's suddenly wondering, wait a minute, we created this group of people and how long until they decide they want to run the show as a, a, on the whole. So now the government has decided they have a problem with Oneros and that's the major conflict. And in this book, we learn the answer to my brother's question. And I don't want to 
I don't want to talk about it too much because it, it's uh, I'm worried it's too much of a spoiler. But if you read Cock carefully, there's one member of Oneros who absolutely hates uh, Patterson more than anyone. And this individual has reasons and they are good. And in Betrayed, you find out what really happened to that character and how this will change the shape of the future forever, at least in this little universe of mine. Uh, I'm gonna apologize for the camera shake. I'm a, I'm a table thumper, so so it moves. I'll try to keep my hands. Uh, I'll try to keep my hands from hitting the table too often. So the idea for Betrayed came from a a concept that I had in my head, but I wanted to create and finish this trilogy so that people who try out my work can get a feel for my voice, my style. Uh, Oddly enough, Onero's Log is probably the darkest stuff I write. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't, you know, obviously when you're an author, you're going to have conflict, you're going to have life, you're going to have death, you're going to have happiness, you're going to have sadness. Uh, but Onero's Log is easily the most graphic uh, and it's easily the most dark in tone. Uh, but it does give people a complete saga to follow and it gives them a way to get to know me. And so that's kind of when, why I started working on it. Uh, so the next thing I want to do for you guys is I actually want to read a portion of Betrayed so that you guys kind of know like what, what, what I'm up to and what's, what's coming on. Uh, and where, what I wanted to read for you guys is chapter one. There's a prologue to Betrayed uh, that kind of sets up the rest of the saga and uh it introduces two new characters but in chapter one we kind of see uh oneros operating the way they've been operating for the last six years since cot came out um and so this is chapter one and it's called finally strong enough Sal Veltri stared at the burned out department store which had a green cast due to the night vision monocular over his right eye the summer of Virginia air felt heavy even without the bulletproof plates and protective vest he wore. He glanced at Brandon Karst and Chris Royd, who were similarly dressed. The husk of a building was on an abandoned lot, and the group inside had already cleared the area of homeless people who might be curious. Sal pressed the talk button on a small radio on his left shoulder. Can we confirm the package is here? Confirmed, Kira Moretti replied. She and her husband, Dom, would be on the opposite side of the compound. There's more good news. They did us a favor and blocked all but two doors. Meet you in the middle, Sal said, going 20. Sal kept his eyes on the members of the Neros who were beside him. They stacked into a line and moved in the sort of unison only hundreds of hours of training could produce. Black boots hardly made a sound as they flowed across old pocked pavement. Even with Kira's information, Sal made it a point to gently test any window or door they came across. He also made sure to glance through the cracked glass to see if any enemies were on guard or even just lounging around. They came to their point of entry. A gentle pull on the boarded in wreck that used to be a glass door told Sal the targets had, hadn't barricaded the entrance. Sal smiled as he held up five thick fingers. After the countdown, Sal, Sal stepped forward and pulled the door open. Chris walked in with his, with his rifle raised. His silencer equipped rifle coughed once as he walked into the building with Brandon hard on his heels. Sal barely let Brandon through the door before he slipped in, turning opposite Brandon and scanning the area in front of him for any enemies. Clear, clear! Chris and Brandon each whispered the indication that they weren't in any danger. Sal looked around, noticing the young man lying on the floor. Blood oozed from the bullet in his chest. Sal gave his friend a nod of approval and pointed left to the wide floor. He looked at Brandon and pointed to the right. He stayed in the center of the building. Each member of the squad could see the other, and each could guard the other in the event of an ambush. They stalked across the enormous room that probably once held a grocery, grocery cell, shelves or clothing displays. Sal was grateful for the mostly empty space, and a quick patrol along the horizontal, horizontal axis of the room allowed them to check behind the worn-out counters and half-eroded boxes. They really aren't expecting anyone. The enemy had traveled nearly 100 miles to find a location in which to hide after kidnapping a little girl whose father had more money than any normal man would know what to do with. Sal and his team stepped in with the kid when the kidnappers refused to return the girl even after her father paid the ridiculous ransom. 
With the large area clear, that meant the kidnappers would be in the rear office areas. Sal's squad mates rallied with him at the only door that went further into the building. They stacked up again. This time, Chris stood up in front to open the door. Sal watched closely as Chris slowly turned the door's handle. Chris yanked the door open and Sal darted in with his rifle raised. The short stubby monocular that comprised Sal's night vision made everything seem to zip by as he looked around. They flowed into a hallway and Brandon stepped next to him. A square man with a scruffy beard came from around a corner. Sal saw the man's mouth open, but a gentle squeeze of Sal's trigger sent a bullet to the man's head. Sal kept walking, keeping his pace even with Brandon. A door opened to Sal's right, but Brandon efficiently took down whoever came out of the door. Chris stayed in the back, ready to step in, just as Brandon entered the room his most recent target just left. Sal, Chris and Sal continued, even as Brandon zipped back out of the room and took the spot at the rear Chris had just left. It was a waltz. Sal and his squad mates moved with a steady, determined pace, and anyone who was unfortunate enough to step into the hall died before they realized they were under attack. One member of the team would search whatever room they came across, while whoever was in the back filled in the gap. The man who left would search a room, take up the spot at the back until it was his turn to fill in for someone else. The hall ended, giving Sal the option to turn right or left. Sal turned right, knowing that Kira's map of the building would lead him to the kidnappers and, more importantly, the little girl they'd stolen. They'd only just gotten into the new hallway when Dom and Kira came around the opposite side. Everyone lowered their weapons and met in the middle, where a door to what should be a small basement sat. The crack under the door showed a streak of light that already glared brightly in Sal's night vision monocular, so he turned it off and flipped it up and away from his eye. The rest of the team did the same. Until it was great, Sal whispered. Always is. Kira Moretti rolled her blue eyes at him in derision, even whispering she had a curtness to her voice. Sal pursed his lips. She even makes my compliments feel like insults. He let the comment go unchallenged. We took out four. The three we killed means there should be about eight men left, Kira replied. That basement down there was for maintenance. Three rooms. Sal nodded and looked at Dom, who took position at the front of the line. The rest of the team filled in between them. Once in position, Dom started to head to the door when bullets punched through the wood, causing him to dive to the ground for cover. Sal snatched the collar of Dom's bulletproof vest to drag the man to safety as the rest of the team fell back. Dom managed to roll to his feet before they reached the end of the hall. Three men burst from the door the team was about to search. One took aim at Kira. I've had enough of this. Sal unleashed a telekinetic push that flung the man Amy and Kira into two other enemies. He opened his mind and all the powers within. Empathy quickly told him where the little girl was. He wrapped a veiled shield around her and went to work. Sal's attention returned to the three most immediate threats. Their screams only lasted an instant as he telekinetically broke their necks and stalked into the hallway. We haven't failed in six years. He stepped into the room and activated his personal shield, which caused bullets to bounce harmlessly away from him. And I haven't lost anyone. Five men stood in terrified awe as he calmly stood before them, despite the persistent rain of bullets they fired. In Sal's mind, he was connected to every person and everything in the room by an intricate web. They finally ran out of bullets and had to reload. So Sal dropped his shield and mentally yanked one of the strands of web his mind used to connect him to everything else. As a result, his target's rifles jerked as if pulled by a physical string. The five people who tried to shoot at Sal were suddenly shooting at each other. Three were shot in the back before the other two thought to drop their rifles. It didn't matter. I won't lose anyone ever again. Not with this power. Sal used his mental abilities to slam the two men into each other and then flung them into the ceiling. If they weren't dead when their bodies cracked against the plaster above, they were by the time they tumbled back down to the concrete floor. The blood oozing from their bodies confirmed Sal's suspicion. He telepathically scanned the building, but he only heard the thoughts of his own teammates, one of which was storming his way. We didn't need Delta techs. It was honestly hard to tell if her stomping was louder than her yelling or the other way around. Tell that to the bullets and almost turn you into Swiss cheese. The face she made seemed an odd mixture of aghast and revolted. I had cover and I'm not wearing this plate vest to impress Juliana Rancid. I'm going to have to assume that's some sort of fashion person. You're seriously mad I kept you from getting shot? No, Kira replied. I'm mad because you're throwing your power around and it's going to get us noticed. Sal, Chris pointed at the shield, still surrounding the horrified little girl. Let's finish the mission first. Brandon and Dom had moved over and started talking to Kira, so Sal took a deep breath and nodded. 
Sal looked around. The bodies on the concrete floor wouldn't help much. He reached out with his abilities and telekinetically pushed the bodies out of view. There wasn't much he could do about the blood, but at least there weren't eight dead men lying around the girl. Sal ignored the glare cure gave him for using his powers again and kept his attention on the girl. Masks, Sal called out as he pulled his own cut Nick cap over his face. The use of powers probably would mean the government would know it was them, but that didn't mean he needed the girl to be able to pick O'Neros out of a photo lineup. The shield faded to reveal the little girl they'd come to rescue. The girl under the tangled mess of blonde hair looked closer to 16 than 12 uh, that the intel said she was. The dirt and smeared makeup didn't do much to mar the adorable young lady's face. Her lips trembled as if she were thinking about how to beg for her release. This is all that matters, he thought to himself, making sure to keep his mind shielded lest Kira decide to get telepathically nosy. We save people. He liked to say he lost count of how many people Oneros had saved, but that would be a lie. Every life with his, was a testament to the power they'd been given, and it was a power he meant to use to save even more people. He knelt down in front of the girl. I know the masks are scary, but they're only on to protect us. We're here to help you. Your dad sent us. Tears glistened in the little girl's brown eyes. She was still terrified. I'm not going, I'm going to untie you, but I need you to stay in the chair. Can you do that? She nodded. After he pulled the ropes from her wrist and ankles, Sal pulled out a phone. Hardwire, secure the line. Brandon nodded at the command. Sal didn't see or hear anything. That was a funny quirk he couldn't puzzle out about his team's abilities. He knew Brandon was using the electromagnetic spectrum in some way to encrypt the cell phone, but he couldn't see how. Sal could do the same thing, but Brandon was the specialist in the area. As the only man on the team, or the planet for that matter, who could use every psychic ability he'd ever heard of and then some, he was a powerhouse. However, Kira, Dom, Brandon, and even Caitlin, who was probably home sulking about being left behind again, could use their own limited abilities in more precise and effective ways. However, none of them could see the other's use of their abilities. Sal dialed the phone. Hello? The, man's, the male voice at the other end of the line sounded exhausted. Sal couldn't use his powers to tell how the man felt. His abilities had a limited distance and wouldn't work through phones or other electronics unless he was trying to use those very electronics the same way Brandon did. Rather than explain what was happening, Sal handed the phone to the child. Daddy? She began sobbing. Sal fought back the urge to comfort her. She may not have seen or even heard what his team did through the shield he put around her, but she still knew his team took down 15 armed gunmen. Daddy, I want to come home. Sal pulled the phone away from her as, he gen as gently as possible. The police have been notified. They're on the way to pick up your daughter. He gave the address and nodded to his team to begin heading for the exit. Who are you? Whatever reward you want, I'll pay. I'll pay double. Thank you. Take care of your daughter, sir. That's all any father needs to do. Sal hung up without listening to the response. The police were on the way and O'Neill's operated in as much secrecy as possible. Sal caught up to the rest of the team as they were piling into their black SUVs. Brandon, handle the, handle the street cameras, please. You want me to wipe the girl's mind too, Robin? Kira asked. That perfect tone and mocking use of his code name was both an insult and a test. I've had just about enough out of you. Sal tried to step in her direction, but Chris cut him off. Brandon and Dom did the same to Kira. Chris gently pulled him away, even as Kira started shouting at Dom. I'm not going to let her question me in the field, Spark, Sal said using Chris's code name. Chris had finally stopped pulling him away from the other members of the team. Is being, right, is being right or proving you're in charge more important than getting that kid home? Chris asked. Sal took a deep breath and Chris smiled. There you go, Chris said. If you get worked up, it'll only encourage her to keep at it anyway. For now, we won. She's exhausting, Sal muttered. Maybe, but is she wrong? Not you too. Chris raised his long slender hands. Just seems to me we had cover in a superior fighting position. Are you mad because she's wrong or because she brought it up in the middle of one of her temper tantrums? Sal shrugged. Can it be both? Look, it's your call when we break out the power. So if you say it couldn't be helped, then that's it. Does that mean we have to have more of a fight? She only retaliates. She can't go nuclear if you don't give her the fuel. Sal took a moment to glance in Kira's direction, but she'd already apparently calmed down, which meant Brandon and Dom had gotten her to cool off. Let's hope that lasts more than five seconds. He turned his attention back to Chris. I'll let it go for now, but I don't care about her feelings if someone's life is on the line. I'm not letting anyone die on my watch. Never again. He may not have needed to use his abilities, and he'd consider that in the future, but the mission was a success, and that's all that mattered. So that's the end of chapter one, and uh, I, I, I hope you 
I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it makes you interested. Uh, 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 and I hope it makes you willing to try out uh, the, the full book, which I'm hoping comes out uh, May 1st. It may go to June 1st, depending upon how long the proofreading process takes. Uh, so what will happen is I'm going to finish proofreading it. I'm going to format it. And then I'm going to drop it on to, to uh, KDP and get everything moving in that direction. Uh, I'm working on it as quickly as I can. I'm about 10%, uh, no, I'm about one third of the way through the proofreading. So I still feel like there's a real good shot to get it done. It, 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 it just, uh, it takes time because you want to get it right. Uh, I read a lot of books as an author where the story really is good. It really is entertaining, but it's just so riddled with proofreading issues and, and holes that it, it, it just takes you out of the world that someone's trying to immerse you in. So when it comes to proofreading, you, you, you don't want to skip on that. And I'm not skipping on it at all. I'm paying all the attention in the world. My editor has already been through it twice. And now I'm going through each chapter over and over and over, uh, uh, just making sure everything looks the way that I think it should look. And as soon as it's ready, I'll get it out to you guys. And I'm positive it'll be before June 1st, if not May 1st. That leads me to the reason we're here. We're not quite going to reveal the cover just yet because what i want to do is i want to give a shout out to my wonderful artist his name is carlos vias and so believe it or not he came to me while i was doing the book covers before i went on a uh, i went on a, a hiatus because it was real hard to organize a book cover competition uh, throughout all of uh, the things that I have to do as an author, a father, a follower of Christ, uh, an employee, uh, teaching students. Uh, so there, there are so many different things. And uh, this career is something I'm passionate about, but it's not more important than, than these other things. So I had to let stuff go. My hope is with these YouTube videos, the book covers come back. While I was doing it before, Carlos reached out to me and said, hey, man, I really love how you look at book covers. I want to work with you. So I started working with him then, and he's just a pleasure to work with. Uh, so while I'm talking about what an awesome human he is, I'm going to bring up his portfolio just so you can see what I see. His work is wonderful, and it started off good, and I've just seen him grow as an artist. I've seen him grow in his talent. And it's so, so awesome to see all of the stuff that he does. He really loves doing monsters and things of that sort. Uh, he likes horror uh, imagery. And so that's his favorite thing to do. But it, his skill is, is such that he can draw and create whatever it is you're looking for. So if you're an author looking for a cover artist, I recommend you give him a chance. If you're a fan of art, you just want to commission him to do a project that's in your head. Uh, you know, give it a shot. I really love this image here. And I, I just truly think you, you should give his portfolio a look, look at all of his work. Uh, and then here's a previous book cover that he did um, for me. This is the book cover to Stealing Freedom. And you'll notice the range of skill he has. He can do these really hideous monster kind of creatures. And then he can do this real beautiful light and, and, and color image. And, and that's a skill set he has. Uh, I'm going to try to bring it up here because uh, I, I, I don't give him enough credit. Uh, so before I show you the cover that he did, I want to show you the thumbnail that I drew for him. Because every time I show this to my friends, they're like, are you serious? So the way Carlos and I work together is... Um, I have a pretty clear idea what I'm looking for in my book covers always. I'm actually pretty particular about it. So I'll send him uh, a, a quick hideous sketch and I'll tell him kind of where I think the light should be, what I'm kind of looking for. I might send him like, uh, usually my covers are taken from an actual plot point in the book. So I'll send him that and I'll talk to him about what's going on and then he'll go to work. But I, I, there, there's nothing to do but to show you how he takes the, the vague details and the uh, horrible drawing I do and then creates something just so beautiful. He's a pleasure to work with. He's always careful to listen to what I'm saying. He's always, um, what I love most about Carlos as an artist is 
He's not so egotistical as to try to get his vision out. He does enough of his own projects where he gets that out of his system. And those works are wonderful in and of themselves. But the next step for him is when he's working with an artist or someone else, he's genuinely trying to bring my vision to life. He respects that this is this is this book. He he invests in that work. And I don't I don't think there's a price you can pay on that. There are artists who are fantastic and they're great. But if I send my book to one of those artists, they're going to make their artistic interpretation of that work. And that's that's totally respectable, it's totally understandable. But there are times when you look at a book cover and as an artist, you're like, ah, that's not really what I was going for, but it's great art, it's wonderful, it's beautiful, let's go with it. Uh, and most, most um, traditionally published authors, they don't have any say in that matter. What I love about Carlos is he's trying to bring the vision in my brain to life and he's patient. He goes through uh, each step in the process and he's always sitting there talking to me about, hey, is this what you were looking for? What do you think about here? You know, how do you want things to work? And his communication is second to none. So I'm going to try to do this. There you go. You see that? Let me, uh, there you go. Try to try to keep the light from going too crazy on it. But I'm just trying to do this. And if you catch any glimpse, that's probably the best angle to look at. Do you, do you see that horrible chicken scratch? Does that make any sense to you as a human? This, by the way, is my best art. That's like, that's like next level art for me. Uh, digitally, I'm 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 not terrible, but when it comes to like drawing traditional, uh, that that really is the best I can do. And so I put that together and I provided him with the uh, general idea that I had, and he went to work. And uh, uh, if I had more time, and if you guys are interested, make a comment below and I'll walk you through the various drafts that we went through. It didn't take that many. Uh, 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 he, he was almost perfect on his first try and everything else was about, you know, various little small details that we wanted to work on and that we wanted to, to kind of hash out. But what ended up happening, uh, and I wanna make sure that I can find what I'm looking for. Uh, what ended up happening is just, just amazing. And so that leads us to the big finale. And we're going to look at these book covers. So I'm super excited. I'm very proud. I think Carlos should be very proud. Uh, and I present to you the cover to Betrayed. There it is. So the figure in this picture is Dom. Um, Dom is a telekinetic. Uh, I, I love Dom because his whole life growing up, uh, this is all backstory stuff, but he was the loyal soldier. He was the one who always believed in the chain and being loyal and following directions. And so, you know, he gets, he gets taken by this corrupt member of his military. And in the back of his head, he's He's thinking, well, this, this was one guy and there are bad people in the world. And so there are bad people in the military. That's not a comment on the military. I, I served in the Navy for 10 years. The point is that bad people are everywhere. And Dom is able to accept that this one bad guy did stuff to him. Uh, but now it's the government after them. And he feels a kind of way about it. <laughs> so so uh, this scene is a scene from the book. And what he just learned in, in that moment is what has him uh, moving with the purpose and anger that he is moving with in this cover below. Uh, it was actually uh, Carlos's idea to add these little power filigrees. Uh, whenever you're working with supernatural, paranormal, fantasy things, and you're talking a visual medium, there are, you know, it, it wouldn't look good. You know, you can't just have a guy like standing there and things happening uh, without too much going on. You know, uh, all the way back to Carrie, you'd see the, 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 she'd turn her head and things would happen. So you have to have some way to, to visually represent that there is something going on. And this was his interpretation of it. And I really appreciated it. Dom and Sal both have an assortment of throwing knives. 
affixed to their bodies so that they can use their telekinesis as additional weapons. And this is amazing. Uh, he put everything together. Usually I'll do the title text and the blurbs, uh, but I'm transitioning platforms. Uh, um, I'm upgrading my computers. So he put everything together and he was so patient. Um, so let's take a quick look at just the front, just so you guys can see how beautiful this is. All right, fine. We'll do it that way. So we're going to look at the front cover for a moment and see what that's all about. Um, so if you're looking for my book on Amazon, this is the cover you're looking for. And I think it's just beautiful. I think it's amazing. I can't thank Carlos enough for it. Every time I look at this cover, I'm super excited. Uh, uh, let me tell you how excited I am. I hate proofreading. I do. I hate it. I My favorite part of the process of writing is typing the story out that first time. I call it my discovery draft. Proofreading is just so tedious and you have to put a lot of time and love into it because you want your story to sing. I look at this cover, I'm like, I'm gonna proofread another chapter. I can't wait till this comes out. I'm so excited. And so I hope that you all have enjoyed this video. I hope that you think the cover is awesome. I know I do. And I hope that you give Cot a try. I hope that you give any of my work a try. And I hope that you uh, give Betrayed a shot when it comes out. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. And I will see you in future projects. God be with you. Bye.